1911, an exciting new novel entitled Sense and Sensibility hit the English literature market. Attributed mysteriously to a lady, the novel follows two sisters in their attempts to find love and happiness in Regency England. It was printed by publisher John Murray at a considerable cost to the author. However, by 1813, the original 750 copies had sold out and readers demanded more. The unnamed author obliged, and Pride and Prejudice was printed with the byline, The Author of Sense and Sensibility. Within the next several years, four more popular novels were released in the same ambiguous manner. Who was this female writer that delighted and challenged readers throughout Great Britain? The answer became public only after her death in 1817. Jane Austen, daughter of an unknown clergyman in the English countryside. Though they were published 200 years ago, Jane Austen's novels continue to delight readers and critics alike today. Austen was completely in touch with the lives of women in the early 19th century, and her unrivaled perception is clear through her female characters, which range from spunky Elizabeth Bennet to insufferable Mrs. Norris. Marriage and money were at the forefront of every young girl's mind, and Austen's characters deal with issues that were tangible for the readers. Her focus on these conflicts placed Austen at the forefront of the new movement among female novelists. The Mad Woman in the Attic, a critical text on the lives and writings of female authors, when focusing on Jane Austen's personal life, states, Austen's personal obscurity was more complete than that of any other famous writer. She was always quick to insist on complete anonymity. To Austen, Remaining anonymous was essential to keeping her day-to-day -day life bearable. Austen's contemporary, Mary Brunton, once wrote, It is better to have glided through the world unknown than be shunned, as literary women are, by the more pretending of others. My dear, I would sooner exhibit as a rope dancer. The literary world was dominated by men like Rousseau, Wordsworth, Lord Byron, and John Keats and it was difficult for a new voice to break in, particularly a female voice. As she said herself, Austen felt inadequate. In a letter to her nephew, she wrote, What should I do with your strong, manly, spirited sketches, full of variety and glow? How could I possibly join them on the little bit, two inches wide, of ivory on which I work with so fine a brush, as produces little effect after much labor? To Austen, there was no hope for her writing, and she was more likely to be shunned than to be praised. Sadly, there was a fair amount of evidence to back up Austen's humble proclamation regarding the relationship between male and female writers. Women's issues were not treated with respect. Contemporaries and later male authors have critiqued Austen for her focus on female issues and characters. Realist author Mark Twain was cold in his denouncement of her writing by saying that Jane Austen is entirely impossible. It seems a great pity that they allowed her to die a natural death. Furthermore, extremely influential American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson stated, I'm at a loss to understand why people hold Miss Austen's novels at so high a rate, which seem to me vulgar in tone sterile in artistic invention, imprisoned in the wretched conventions of English society without genius, wit, or knowledge of the world. Never was life so pinched and narrow. All that interest in any character introduced is this one. Has he or she the money to marry with? Austen's writing style was dismissed her topics thought trivial, and her social commentary disregarded. She was placed by these influential men in a box because of her subject matter, and they did not care to find the deeper implications of her writing. However, Jane Austen's predicament was not simply the product of her subject matter. Women in general were strongly discriminated against because of the social impact of certain essays and the thinking patterns of men. Women were seen as an object for a young man to attain as a means for improving his life and providing entertainment, money, social standing, and children. As a general rule, men desired wives who were affectionate, beautiful, and submissive. This attitude resulted in a rather sad predicament for women. 
Too often, a girl would spend her early life making herself appealing. Helpful essays written in the time would offer advice on securing husbands. Dr. John Gregory wrote a book entitled A Father's Legacy to His Daughters, which contained thoughtful notes on education, such as, If you are determined at all events to marry, I would advise you to make all your reading and amusements of such a kind as do not affect the heart nor the imagination, except in the way of wit or humor. Similarly, popular Enlightenment author Rousseau penned his work on female education with lines like, What is most wanted in a woman is gentleness, formed to obey a creature so imperfect as man, a creature often vicious and always faulty. She should early learn to submit to injustice and to suffer the wrongs inflicted on her by her husband without complaint. Jane Austen, the champion of audacious female archetypes, must have felt apprehensive of such an awful predicament. She embodied all the characteristics Gregory and Rousseau argued against, and in fact, it was difficult for her to find a suitor who was willing to take her. This scene, taken from the 2007 film documenting Jane Austen's life, offers insight into her family and social life. Dying to tradesmen, mending, scratching, scraping, endlessly, endlessly making do. I understand that our circumstances are difficult, Mum. There is no money for you. Surely something could be done. What we can put by must go to your brothers. You will have nothing unless you marry. Well, then I will have nothing, for I will not marry without affection, like my mother. And now I have to dig my own damn potatoes! Would you rather be a poor old maid? Ridiculous, despised, the butt of jokes, the legitimate sport of any village lout with a stone and an impudent tongue? Affection is desirable. Money is absolutely indispensable. I could live by my... Your what? I could live by my pen. Let's knock that notion on the head once and for all. What's this? Trouble amongst my women. Come, take hands and there's an end. In the end, Mr. Harris Bigwither, a neighbor and decidedly undesirable husband, proposed. Austin clearly had no attachment to such a man but the social pressure of the time dictated that she must accept. Begrudgingly, she did, but as her sister wrote, Jane found she was miserable and that the place and fortune which would certainly be his could not alter the man. She ultimately retracted her acceptance. She refused to lower her standards and abandon her freedom to write and her ideals of finding love and equality in marriage. Jane Austen never found the love and respect that she dreamt in her novels, but she did forge forward as a writer and was unconstrained by the social ties of marriage. Her life was a bold testimony to women's rights, and her life was her own. Other female authors at the time attempted to formalize Jane Austen's approach to marriage and life in separate essays. Where Jane Austen chose the subtle molding of social norms within her characterization and plots, another author, Mary Wollstonecraft, chose the approach of a direct attack. In her aptly titled essay, The Vindication of the Rights of Women, Wollstonecraft takes popular beliefs on femininity and turns them on their head. She opens with a passionate address to her readers. My own sex, I hope, will excuse me if I treat them like rational creatures, instead of flattering their fascinating graces and viewing them as if they were in a state of perpetual childhood, unable to stand alone. Wollstonecraft was boldly radical and strong-willed for her time. Even Jane Austen would never have dreamt of taking her ideas to such a sarcastic level. However, 
Wollstonecraft's point is valid as men did view women as weak and helpless. In contrast to this widely held belief, Wollstonecraft wrote, I wish to persuade women to endeavor to acquire strength, both of mind and body, and to convince them that the soft phrases, susceptibility of heart, delicacy of sentiment, and refinement of taste are almost synonymous with epithets of weakness, and that those beings are only the objects of pity, and that kind of love which has been termed its sister will soon become objects of contempt. She advocated for women to rise above the stereotype of weak figures who required endless support from so-called strong men. She writes, It is vain to expect virtue from women till they are in some degree independent of men. She urges for women to build up a rational mind through education, reading, and exercise. However, in reality, Wollstonecraft's approach was not practical. An independent woman appeared brash, opinionated, stubborn, and on the whole, rather unsavory. Wollstonecraft was ahead of her time. Strong women were unappealing to men and were shunned by the marriage-obsessed society of the 19th century. With increasingly modern and liberal views of women's roles coming into conflict with the traditional societal corset of femininity, Jane Austen's final novel appeared in 1814 as a contrast to Wollstonecraft's bold statements while continuing to advocate for the worthiness of the female mind. One of her more controversial and conflicted works, Mansfield Park contrasts views of women's societal roles while also presenting Austen's personal conflict over the definition of womanhood, her personal doubts about stubbornness, education, and strong wills. This is prevalent throughout Mansfield Park in the antithetical sister sets of Lady Bertram and Mrs. Norris, as well as Fanny Price and Mary Crawford. Both of these sets of sisters exhibited desired characteristics in a woman, and yet were also incomplete without their antithesis. Mary Crawford and Mrs. Norris fall into the so-called bad female archetype within the context of the novel. Both are outspoken, opinionated, materialistic, and self-serving. In other words, completely undesirable in the eyes of men. However, Mary Crawford also exhibits wit, respectability, good manners, and is rather personable. Mrs. Norris, too, is not completely bad, but is often seen as a strong-minded and independent woman who is unwilling to fully submit to the authority of her male superior, Sir Thomas. In the end, however, it is the so-called good female archetypes that win out, Lady Bertram and Fanny Price. Lady Bertram sets the standard for the ideal role of a woman. She is quiet and unassuming, though also somewhat corpse-like. Her lack of interest in intellectual, business, and political pursuits, and her general acquiescence, seem to warrant her a financially successful marriage, the ultimate goal in society at the time. This sets the precedent for Fanny, who is taken in by the wealthy Bertrams, in order to better her standing in society and her marriage prospects. She is trapped in angelic reserve, moralizing almost to a fault, exhibiting beyond ladylike propriety, verging on the ridiculous. Fanny's reserve is juxtaposed to Mary's audacity, Fanny's moral superiority to Mary's materialism, and her propriety to Mary's wit. While both Fanny and Mary vie for Edmund, the wise elder cousin turned clergyman, their suitability as a potential wife and an ideal female is called into question. In the end, however, it is Mary's outspokenness that is punished, while Fanny's cool reserve and superior morals win her the affections of Edmund. With this in mind, then, what is Jane Austen attempting to say with the triumph of propriety over wit? On the surface, traditionalism seems to be the winning virtue in the split between Mary and Fanny. However, a deeper look shows that Fanny subtly takes on many of Wollstonecraft's hopes for the next generation of females. She was bold in her dismissal of Henry Crawford, stood up against Sir Thomas, and strongly proclaimed her love of reading and writing to improve her mind. She can be seen in this light as a transitionary woman with an independent spirit combined with the graceful and submissive nature of a Regency-era woman. In her final novel, 
Jane Austen made an insightful observation in the voice of her character, Anne Elliot. Men have had every advantage of us in telling their own story. The pen has been in their hands. Jane Austen encapsulates the trials and tribulations that women faced daily, but the female voice was gaining traction, propelling the first wave of the feminist movement into existence. <laughs>